second day of National Distance Learning Week. We're very excited to uh, present this session to you today. Um, this today's session, as you can see from the slide, is Empowering Leaders of Online Education. And this is part of National Distance Learning Week 2022. I'm really excited for this discussion. Being in a leadership role myself in our organization here in Utah, we know that being a boss or an instructor is hard enough, but being a leader is even harder, especially with the new challenges and um, our current work in educational environments uh, that, that get thrown at us here. So we'd like this to be an open and engaging session um, with some useful takeaways for us all. So with that, I would like to introduce our panelists for today. We have Dr. Travis Neal. Travis is a KC-135 pilot in the United States Air Force and a doctor of strategic leadership. He recently completed four years with Air University's Global College of Professional Military Education, where he served as a course director uh, for the leadership concentration of their online master's program. In this position, he also developed and taught multiple online in-residence elective courses at both the undergraduate and graduate levels. In addition to power dynamics and online education, his professional interests include aviation, leadership development, culture, and emerging technologies in the training environment. He and his wife, Kate, are currently moving to Tampa, Florida, where, as we just learned, they are buckling down for the incoming hurricane with their two dogs, Charlie and Bonnie. Um, and he will spend the next three years flying the KC-135 before he, yay, retires from the military and has to figure out what he wants to be when he grows up. Well, thank you for joining us, Travis. Our other panelist today is Dr. Georgiana Laws. Georgiana is an online higher education leadership practitioner, researcher, and educator, as well as a USDLA executive board member. Her research focuses on the legitimate power that chief online education officers, COEOs, hold over online program quality assurance at higher education institutions. She speaks to national audiences about the COEO role, quality in the administration of online programs, quality in the design and delivery of online education, best practices, and instructional design for online ed, <laughs> as well as best practices in teaching online, cybersecurity implications for online education, and virtual team building. Before I hand the time over to them, I would just like to give a quick shout out to our sponsors for uh, today's and uh, all of this week's sessions. As you can see, here are our gold sponsors. Here are our silver sponsors, and we would like to thank all of our sponsors at all of these levels for their continued support and participation in USDLA and National Distance Learning Week. So with that, I will turn the time over to Gio and Travis. Thank you kindly, um, James, for the introduction. And um, if I could trouble you for co-host um, for Travis, so he can share slides. Oh, you bet. Let me get that going for you. Thank you kindly. All right. So today we will um, continue the theme of leadership. Um, uh, we heard on Monday from our keynote speaker that um, leaders these days are encountering um, unprecedented um, circumstances and that they need to be able to um, uh, come up with unique solutions to these unique problems. Um, then we heard from Dr. Tony Pena um, about some common mistakes um, that online leaders make. Uh, this morning, uh, Dr. Jerry Henley uh, talked about change management and um, sort of humanizing um, change management. So now in our programming, we're getting to the point of talking about um, empowering leaders. Next slide, please. Um, the points that we will hit with our presentation um, will kind of follow this, uh, this um, overview here. Essentially, we'll talk about how this chief online education officer role is the driver of quality in the administration of online programs. Um, then we'll talk about um, why we need to empower our chief online education officer. We'll also talk about what exactly is empowerment, how we measure it, and then how we enact it. So now, on our next slide, please, uh, we would like to invite our audience to chime in in what ways does 
your institutional online education leader drive quality in online program administration? Um, I know that there's a little bit of a time lag between um, us and the live stream. So I'll just give it a moment. Okay, I'm keeping an eye on those comments. Now, James, I know you are in leadership. Uh, can I uh, put you in the spotlight here in the hot seat? <laughs> in what way do leaders drive quality at your institution? Well, I'd say at our institution, we're we're considered a, a service provider for ed, the educational online community in the state of Utah. And we have always prided ourselves um, on, on the quality of the, not just the content, but also the experience. And by the experience, I mean, trying to make the technology as transparent as possible. And that's, that's coming in many, many different forms. And that's from having a, a pretty rigorous certification process for our distance learning edu uh, our classrooms, the equipment that's used. We actually, anybody that wants to participate in our statewide system, we take them through a couple of steps and make sure that audio, video, um, any of their presentation needs uh, functions well and functions from the very start. Because as we know, uh, not just as a participant, but more so as an instructor, teaching online, if your first experience uh, with this technology is, is less than quality or you have a bad experience, that's going to be your perception moving forward. So we work really hard to make sure that that instructor and their students' first experience with this technology is a quality one. Thank you so much, James. That was very kind of you. All right, next slide, please. So now let's break it down. What exactly does this COEO acronym stand for? Um, it stands for Chief Online Education Officer. This is a role um, that we've seen created in the last decade or so um, with the um, uh, expansion of online as online has entered mainstream, more and more institutions started creating this Chief Online Education Officer role. Um, Presidents and chancellors typically create this type of role, um, giving them purview of all things online. So essentially, COEO is an umbrella term for the person um, overseeing online programs. Next slide, please. Um, the COEO um, actually goes by many different names. There are 20-something um, variations, at least, of um, how you may um, see this title reflected at your institution. So the person in charge of online at your institution might be called coordinator of, or director, or um, manager, or dean, or um, maybe a vice president, or vice provost. Um, and then the second piece could be distance learning, could be distance education, could be e-learning, could be online education. There are so many variations. Um, so this is a population that's kind of hard to um, locate because of this variation in titles. In the literature, um, the most um, uh, published, um, you know, most researchers tend to refer to this role as chief um, online officer or chief online learning officer or online learning leader. Um, so if you read um, Fredrickson's um, research or Heron and Team's research or Leonard and Geert's uh, research, um, you will see these types of variations. Next slide, please. So now we established that the chief online education officer is the person in charge of um, online education at an institution. Um, but why do we need this kind of person? Um, well, we have uh, a need for direct organizational innovation of strategic importance. And that falls, um, again, in the purview of this chief online education officer. This person absorbs a number of duties from uh, mission and strategy to accreditation to more operational matters, such as um, scheduling classes, uh, assuring quality, uh, designing and developing curriculum, uh, providing and supporting educational technology, 
uh, providing faculty development and providing miscellaneous resources related to running an online program operation. So essentially the COEO is a function um, that we see beyond middle management, um, somebody offering um, strategic vision for the institution as part of senior academic leadership. And this person uh, sits at the center of issues and influences that determine present and future uh, policy when it comes to online education. So these are some of the reasons we need a chief online education officer. If um, you think of any other reasons, please chime on um, our chat on education. Next slide, please. So now, um, we established that most institutions have a chief online education officer, that um, this officer might, uh, their title might be um, called different things based on the institution, and that um, their portfolio might differ. So then how do we calibrate this role of chief online education officer at, um, at a given institution? I wish I could say there is a silver bullet, but there isn't one. Um, one tool that um, has been around for quite some time, um, a tool that I had the opportunity to use as part of my research was the quality scorecard for the administration of online programs. And essentially this quality scorecard um, laid out nine criteria. By now, the scorecard has evolved. Um, it has a different number of criteria. But back when I was using this as my research instrument, uh, most important to the administration of online programs was having institutional support. So um, if the institution desires to offer online programs, um, then online needs to be mission critical. It needs to be of strategic importance to the institution. Therefore, the chief online education officer needs to have institutional support. They need to be able to rely on a technology um, infrastructure and um, a team providing tech support. The chief online education officer also needs to have under their purview course development and instructional design, which also includes um, decisions about course structure, about teaching and learning, about social and student engagement. And we know that last year, the Department of Education updated the definition of online learning um, to um, specify that uh, we're not talking about distance learning unless we have regular and substantive interaction. So that's something that is within the purview of the chief online education officer. And um, other uh, factors that are in the purview of the chief online education officer when it comes to um, impacting quality of online program administration have to do with faculty support and faculty development, student support, as well as evaluation and assessment. Next slide, please. So now um, to sort of wrap up this idea of calibrating the role of chief online education officer at, um, at a given institution, um, as I mentioned earlier, there is no silver bullet. Uh, there is no ideal way to um, calibrate this role. Um, what um, this calibration depends on is institutional culture, institutional complexity, um, how important online is to, um, to the mission of the institution. So if you look across the board, we have high levels, mid levels, and low levels. And um, what I uh, was able to um, infer from my own uh, research was that these levels tend to go hand in hand. In other words, um, the degree of complexity of the institutional environment should match the complexity of processes and structure. So that means the more complex the institutional environment, the more important it becomes for that institution to balance um, high degrees of differentiation, which means um, segmentation into subsystems with unique attributes. So this is the group that does this, this is the group that does that. 
So high degrees of differentiation need to be balanced with high degrees of integration, um, where integration means unity of effort among the organization's subsystems toward the completion of institutional tasks. Um, so again, the higher the level of complexity, um, the higher um, the level of differentiation and integration. Um, the number of reporting units, um, the more important online is to an institution, um, the more units would then report to the chief online education officer. So think about it this way. If the institution is just offering two or three online courses, uh, then probably the chief online education officer will be placed um, lower on the um, hierarchy, um, on the org chart, so to speak. They might be called um, director or manager or coordinator, and um, they might not have any staff. But if the institution is managing one or more online programs, then probably the chief online education officer will be placed higher on the org chart. They might be called um, director or um, dean of online or vice president of online. And they're likely to have more reporting units under them. They're likely to have instructional design. They're likely to have ed tech, faculty development, so on and so forth. And um, again, um, all of these go hand in hand with levels of quality. So the more control the chief online education officer has over quality, the higher they are on the org chart, the higher the integration level, the more reporting units um, uh, sit under the chief online education officer, uh, the more complex the institution and its processes, and also the higher the level of legitimate power. And Dr. Neil is going to talk to us more about legitimate power in just a moment. Next slide, please. So I will prepare for a handoff to Dr. Neil here by asking our audience um, to tell us, in your opinion, why do we need to empower chief online education officers? And Travis, back to you. I think you might actually have a couple more slides after this, but this is a good opportunity just to talk about what empowerment is. And here in a second, we're going to break down a whole bunch of different types of power and kind of what they look like. But if you want to think about what empowerment is, it's just the sharing of power. It's giving power from one individual to another. Um, so thinking about what can we give with regards to power and influence to our COEOs, to our chief online education officers, to empower them to be able to get a quality product to the students, because they're really the, the, the end goal is to get a quality product to our students, not just to see how many pieces of paper we can hand out or how much money we can make. It's about making the next generation that much better than, than we were. It's about, it's about all of us. So um, I'd love to hear kind of what, what you guys have seen uh, as far as what we need to do to empower our COEOs. Thank you so much. And while we're waiting for our audience to chime in, if I could trouble you to go to the next slide. Um, so um, I mentioned that yesterday, Dr. Pina um, gave a wonderful presentation talking about common mistakes in leading online education programs. So these kind of go hand in hand with why we need to empower our chief online education officer. The first error that Tony mentioned was that we offer online education for the wrong reasons. Um, whenever we focus on um, increasing enrollment and revenue only, then we are um, going about it the wrong way. We are not um, empowering our chief online education officer if we're just telling them you are hired to increase enrollment, period. Um, that puts them at a disadvantage. We're not setting them up for success. The second error that Tony mentioned was that we confuse increasing options and decreasing barriers for existing students with educating new students outside of traditional boundaries. So um, existing students could be very well served by hybrid programs, whereas new students outside of traditional boundaries will need the full flexibility of online education. Uh, which means the chief online education officer needs to have authority um, over decisions related to all things online program administration. 
The third error is uh, making it all about the courses and forgetting that the courses operate within an ecosystem, um, that we need to have um, support services, that we need to have processes, we need to have infrastructure. Um, without paying attention to all the things around online courses, we're essentially making online learners second-class citizens. Um, so again, a way to empower chief online education officers is to let them set the strategy. Um, they would tell you that it's not all about online courses. It's about much more than that. It's about a, a whole system. Um, the fourth error has to do with um, adding online to the typically decentralized structure of a higher ed institution, which marginalizes online education, which tends to produce higher levels of quality in a more centralized uh, fashion. So again, the chief online education officer needs to be able to advocate for um, centralization so that there is consistency from course to course within a program, for example. Uh, the fifth there, we're using existing policies and procedures for online. They're not going to work. So again, the chief online education officer needs to have the power to be able to enact policies and procedures in a collaborative fashion, of course, uh, but they need to have that voice. The sixth error is equating online course design with online teaching. Um, whenever we um, have a chief online education officer, they will advise us that um, building a course and teaching a course are two different things. Um, and there ought to be faculty development supporting our faculty in both teaching online and in um, designing online courses. And lastly, we expect faculty to be experts in all things online education, which is unreasonable. Um, a faculty member is a subject matter expert. Beyond that, again, we offer um, supporting services such as instructional design, and we offer faculty development, all of which are um, under the purview of our chief online education officer. Next slide, please. And this is where we hand off. And uh, Glenn Fowler uh, is saying to ensure quality control and continuity of presentation. Absolutely. That's a great reason to have a chief online education officer and to empower them. Uh, we can skip all the way to uh, part three. Um, I, I did want to jump in here real quick, Gio, and just point out to the audience that as you kind of scan through this list that Gio put together, um, when we start talking about the different forms of power, it's really, really focus on legitimate power, expert power, and financial power. Uh, while all the different forms of power we're going to talk about are important, specifically to the role of the chief online education officer, those three forms of power are going to be very, very important. So next, Dr. Neil will talk to us about what empowerment is. So please feel free to chat, um, to chime in what empowerment means to you. Um, so James, have you seen anything in the chat yet? I'm keeping an eye on the chat. We're all good to go. Okay. Um, so I did want to start real quick with a story about my wife because she just finished up her master's degree uh, online. It was her first time doing an online course, uh, sorry, an online program. And it was from a very well-known university. A lot of people would recognize this name, um, but the program was kind of beyond bad. It was almost embarrassing. I remember she was forced to take these online quizzes. She's in a graduate level program and it's just regurgitation type questions she's getting. And the answer to one of the questions was a thousand. And she put one zero zero zero, submitted it. And it said, I'm sorry, that's incorrect. It should be one comma zero zero zero. And she was actually docked points from her grade because she was answering questions incorrectly in, in that fashion. And those are the kind of quality issues that you'll start missing if you don't actually take the time to empower uh, your online education department, because it really is a different beast. And then the sooner you recognize that as an institution, the stronger your online program is gonna be. And if you're worried about getting the number of students through, getting more students in your program, the best way to do that is to have a quality online education program. My wife, I guarantee you, will never recommend an online program to anybody. And 
it's, it's stuff like that that is why a lot of online education programs are still considered second tier to in residence when those of us who work in the field recognize the potential and the, the, the power in this form of education if you do it right. And you reach an entirely different group of individuals that you don't necessarily hit in residence. And we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, so if there's nothing in the chat, I'm gonna go ahead and press. If I can figure out the technology myself. <laughs> no worries. So before we actually get into power, I always start my discussions with this, this discussion about human motivation, because when we talk about people and specifically leaders and managers, they tend to be motivated by a combination of three things. And the, the three things would be affiliation or the desire to be part of a group or be liked. Uh, achievement, being able to say that you accomplished something uh, challenging or difficult. Um, and then you've got that uh, motivation for power or being able to control situations or circumstances for people. Now, again, we want all of these things, but for each individual person, person usually there's one thing that actually drives our decision making. So let's look at that real quick. So based on that, which motivation do we think would make the worst type of leader? The worst type of leader is actually motivated for a desire for power. So knowing that, uh, looking at what we think makes the best type of leader and the best type of lead leader is actually motivated by power, which is weird, right? So how does that work? How can the best and the worst both be motivated by the same thing? So I'll tell you that in a second, but let's look at affiliation and achievement real quick first. So Affiliation, you don't want that to be the driving factor in your decision making because these individuals who are motivated by this in manager or leadership positions tend to avoid confrontation, they struggle making decisions, they vacillate a lot. Um, and it's okay to want to be liked, but you can't let that drive your decision making. Uh, achievement is good. You actually want a high level of achievement orientation in your leaders and your managers but you don't want it to be the driving factor because if it's the driving factor, you start running into these situations where you get this, look what I did versus look what we did. People um, start stepping on people that they, they struggle to share their success. So you want them to really seek those challenges and try to accomplish things, but that can't be the motivating factor. So let's look at power a little deeper now. So there's two types of power orientation. I know it's kind of tricky. I, I snuck that one on on you, but uh, that you've got this personalized power orientation, and this is the bad leader, if you haven't already noticed. These are the individuals that try to consolidate power and use it for their own benefit. Their goal is to manipulate and subvert others, and their goal is personal gain and preservation of that power. So once they get the power, they use their power to keep that power. And what we really want in our leaders and our managers and our chief education, uh, on uh, chief online education officers, is what we call a socialized power orientation. These are the individuals that use the power they have to, uh, to develop and help others. Uh, and they lean towards more of a empowerment and participative leadership approach. And this is why it's important to empower our chief online education officers and making sure that they understand that the goal of empowering them is for them to empower their teams and empower their students. It's not giving all the power to one person so they can keep it. It's so that they can share it. And that's incredibly important to remember. But here's the warning. This is what we have to be careful of. If you'll notice, personalized power orientation, socialized power orientation, they're both oriented towards this desire for power. And if you're not careful, these individuals who start with a socialized power orientation start to consolidate that power and it becomes more and more tempting to use it for themselves. Um, so they can start with the best of intentions and they just, they just hit this switch that I have so much power, I can't lose it. You'll hear phrases like, do you know who I am? I, I've earned this. I deserve this. When you hear those things, that's where you really need to be, be cautious about that person's intentions. So the real question now, how do we keep that from happening, especially when we start empowering our chief online education officers? First, you got to hire people with integrity. And I always like to think of it from a structural standpoint, right? You put pressure on something. It might bend, but it's going to hold. You don't want it to break, right? Same thing. As soon as your integrity breaks, you've lost it. So you have to do everything you can to fight and keep your integrity. But 
we're all human, right? Like we all make mistakes. That temptation can get really, really strong. So the second piece you have to have is accountability. And this is where, as the leaders of our chief online education officers, we can help them out. We hold them accountability. We, we surround them with a team that's diverse, that has different strengths and weaknesses. You don't want to surround yourself with people that look like you, walk like you, talk like you, because you're going to have the same blind spots and you're not going to recognize that danger coming at you. You don't want yes men. You don't want people that are just going to tell you what you want to hear because that's going to put you in a bad situation too. So make sure you're surrounding yourself with people that are going to challenge you and call you out when you're wrong. You want somebody to look at you and say, no, that's wrong. That's the best way to counter the negative effects that power can have. Now that we've talked about the warning, let's talk about power. So what are power and influence? So again, I, I have this strong love for leadership and, and making sure we do it right. And if you look, uh, power is a very, very big part of that. But defining power is very, very important. If you're talking about power and somebody's listening about power and you have different definitions of what power is, bad things can happen. So one of the more common definitions of power that I've heard is power is being able to get what you want despite resistance. And that's very similar to a lot of the other definitions of power, but just the wording in it makes it feel like the goal of power is to force something through. It almost has a negative connotation to it. And there's a lot of empirical evidence and studies that go towards looking at power as a noun, something you have, and it's that forcing through and influence as a noun, as something you have that's more uh, geared towards intrinsically motivating people and getting them excited about their job. But for the purposes of this discussion, what French and Raven defined uh, power as is more along the lines of power is the potential or ability to influence or counter the influence of others. So power is the tool and influence is the verb. It's what you do with that tool. So the purposes of this discussion, that's how we're going to define it. So we're going to key in on that word influence as well. Influence is being able to affect a change in attitude, behavior, or situation. And if you look at the common definition of de definitions of leadership, there's always kind of the, the same three factors you're going to see. Leadership is about influencing a group towards a goal. So based on this, leadership is about influencing people and power is the ability to influence. So leaders need to understand how power works and what it is because whether they think it's a good thing or not, they're going to have it and they need to understand it. So French and Raven is where we're gonna start. So French and Raven came out and they came out with position power and personal power. The first three they came up with was legitimate reward and coercive. Later, Raven came in and added information power. Personal power would be your expert and referent power. And then as a place to start, that was French and Raven. If you look at a lot of the other lists that these other scholars have come up with, I've kind of seen a trend with these four other types of power, ecological power, network or connection power, physical power, and financial power. Part of the problem with defining power in this way is one, it's difficult to measure. How much, how much legitimate power do I have? That's not something you can quantify, which makes it difficult to measure. Uh, the applicability of it is also kind of tricky too. It's how do I use legitimate power? Well, you have to start breaking down what does legitimate power look like in the real world? And that's what we're going to try to do here. So let's look at legitimate power first, because uh, Dr. Laws was really harping on the need to get legitimate power to our chief online education officers. And that's 100% true. Uh, this is where your decision making and a lot of other factors come into play, but there's more to legitimate power. It can be rank, it can be age, it can be a title. And I, that's why I told you to take a second and look at those, that list of titles that Dr. Laws had listed for us, because title is very important. Gender is important. Citizenship is important. Legal status is important. Or just like being first in line gives you legitimate power. Oh, he was here first. There's a lot of factors that go into as a culture, how we define who has more power than other people. So we can't just think about what title we're going to give our chief online education officer because of how we're going to work internally. But you have to think when this chief online education officer goes external to your organization, what power are you giving them to be able to influence things in a way that's going to benefit your organization and your university? Reward power. This is not having rewards, but this is 
the ability to create rewards, the ability to distribute rewards, and the ability to choose rewards. So what is it that, so I can create, you're going to be the online educator of the year. That's something you can empower your chief online education officer to create. They can pick what those rewards are going to be and who's going to get the awards. So those are something that we can do. Coercive power is pretty basic. It's just the ability to punish or harm. Thinking about uh, formal reports, docking pay, it could be physical punishment, hopefully not in our, our online education departments, but in culture in general, it could be that, or withholding something that somebody wants could be coercive power. Information power, it, it can get confused with expert a little bit, but information power is about one, the access to information and control over the flow of information. So if you think about a lot of our LMSs, they have this homepage, this splash page, where you can put a lot of information on that every student can see. And if you've got a whole bunch of in-residence type notes that you put into the online education environment, you can water down what the online education department is trying to do and, and what they're trying to say. So understanding that and giving your chief online education officer the ability to control the flow of that information is important. Expert power. This is one we really need to hit on because this part is very, very, very important. Uh, ed expert power falls under the education, training, and certifications you have, as well as the experience and the skills that you have. This is where we live. This is education, right? Our goal is to empower our students with expert power. And the quality that we provide is only going to increase the amount of expert power that our students walk away with. And our goal is to create a quality student that can go out and actually make a meaningful impact in society. Uh, the other part of this too is making sure one, that your chief online education officer has the experience and the background in online education, or at least has a team around them that has, has knowledge in that. And keeping in mind that it, this is always changing, right? The, the online education environment is a rapidly changing environment. So making sure that you continue to give them opportunities, going to conferences, personal study time, anything they need to, to stay on top of what's most current and most effective in online education. Referent power is another one that I really want to hit on, especially with regards to leadership. Referent power can be the most effective form. And when we talk about referent power, we're talking about admiration, trust, inspiration, respect. It's when some when when people look up to you and admire you and want to emulate your behaviors, you have referent power. But this can also be dangerous because if you collect too much referent power, you will start to develop yes men around you and yes women. They basically look at you and go, oh, they couldn't do anything wrong. They're just fantastic, right? You, you want to avoid that. And the best way to avoid that is to give referent power back to your people by telling them, hey, man, I really appreciate what you do. I couldn't do my job without you. Uh, you know, you did a great job on that. And when you give others referent power, you're basically keeping them from becoming a yes person, but also you're building that trust and that respect uh, across your, your leaders and your subordinates. So very, very important. Ecological power may be one you haven't heard of, and this is control over the environment and control over the atmosphere. So again, in residence, uh, instructors and developers and designers may not understand the intricacies and the unique situations that come up in the online education environment. LMS is the way everything is structured and laid out and how schedules work. It's all completely different than in residence. So giving the team and the chief online education officer the ability to manage that is very important. Control over the atmosphere is also very important. Um, that's uh, keeping control over bullying, harassment, discrimination, things of that nature. And if as a leader, you don't take control over that and make sure that doesn't happen, somebody else is going to take that control and potentially create a, a toxic environment. So you got to be careful with that and make sure that you've got chief online education officers that are uh, courageous enough to step in and make sure that does not happen. Network connection power. So this is really just access to the powers of others. Um, and you can think of this in two ways, quality and quantity. So Quantity, it'd be like you have a bunch of people. So when you start hearing about these situations where somebody is coming to speak at a university 
and a large group of students shows up and interrupts them and says, we don't want you talking here. They're using their quantity of students to influence that situation. And one student alone wouldn't be able to do that, but a whole bunch of them would. The other side of that is quantity. You don't have to have a big, big team necessarily, but you got to make sure that the people on that team are able to address all of the problems that might arise. And that's what, that's what network and connection power is about. Physical power, you may not see as much in the online education environment, but you might. Um, physical power would be like your appearance. Are you well-dressed? If I show up to teach a class and I've got mustard stains on my shirt and my hair is all kind of sticking up on the side, I'm not going to be able to influence my audience as well as if I was well put together. Now, on the opposite side, if you overdress or you come off as arrogant, same thing. I'm going to lose the ability to influence that, that group. Presence. Actually, being present is a major part of it. If you think about leaders who lead through email, they're not as effective as those who can lead in person. The online education environment, if you think about a lot of the tools that are, that are out there these days that are uh, available to us, I mean, what we're doing right now, we're all in different parts of the world, and yet we are able to have a dialogue, and, and hopefully we're able to influence you by giving you this information and helping you understand the expert power and, and distributing that to your organizations. This isn't something we could have done 30 years ago. I, I might have been able to talk to a couple of people on a phone, but this is a big one in online education. And manipulation. So actually being able to manipulate something is a form of power. It, it, the, the common example I like to use, if you think about the little handicap signs that are on the doors that open the door for you, you might not think about that. That's an everyday thing. But what you're doing is you're giving somebody with a physical handicap the physical power to manipulate that door and get into that building. And if you did not give them that power, you might lose out on the expert power and the accountability that they might bring to your team. And those are the kind of things that are also important. Financial power, this one's pretty basic too. It's, it's cash, credit, barter, favors, anything you can do but what's interesting about financial power is the versatility that, that it brings. You can use finances to basically go get any other form of power that you want. Um, so this is going to be really important when you're talking about chief online education officers, where they're going to have a whole team that they have to pay. They might have to give them rewards or bonuses. They might have to pay for tools like online education tools, like access to Zoom, stuff like that. This is, this is another big one for, for your chief online education officers. All right, so that's the list. We talked about what all those things were. Now, you also have to understand that power isn't always the same. It's, it, it can change. So power is, one, it's situational. Just because it's applicable in one situation doesn't mean that it's applicable in all situations. The example I use being in the military, I've got rank, right? So I'm a major. So if I go to an airman and I say, hey, airman, I need you to move these boxes because I'm a major. Well, they're going to do it because my legitimate power in that situation actually has value, right? They may not like it, but they're going to do it. So uh, now let's say I go to Walmart and I'm like, hey, customer service guy, I want you to take back this robot vacuum because I'm a major. They're going to look at me like I'm crazy. My legitimate power has no value in that situation. So this, again, when we were talking about it earlier with chief online education officers, the title that you give them can be more or less effective when they go to an external environment and they're trying to influence stuff, when they go to conferences or they're trying to you know, establish a contract. Or am I talking to the dean or am I talking to the assistant manager? Even though all the roles and responsibilities might be the same, just the title can have an effect on what they're able to do. This is also very, very important. Uh, power is cultural. So here's the definition. I know it's long. We'll break it down in a second. So the culture of a group can be defined as the accumulated shared learning of the group as it solves problems of external adaptation and internal integration, which has worked well enough to be considered valid and therefore to be taught to new members as the correct way to perceive, think, feel, and behave in relation to those problems. So first, it's accumulated shared learning. This is over time we figured out this is the best way for our culture to do business. It has solved all of our problems up to this point. And because it's solved the problems, this must be the right way to do it. So we're gonna teach our new members to do it this way. We have been doing in-residence education for a long time. We have developed a lot of shared learning and a lot of valid situ uh, so ways to solve these problems in residence for a long time. 
in the grand scheme of things, online education has been around what, 20, 30 years, maybe. So it's very, very common for institutions to think that it worked well enough for the past 3000 years, it must work well online as well. And that's not true. And we have to break through that barrier. The sooner we realize that online education is its own subculture and has its own ways of solving these problems and adapting to the environment, uh, until we realize that that's a truth, we are always going to be keeping our online programs behind. So we need to address that. So when we get into this, we have to think what culture is prominent. There's cultural adaptations, which is where I'm going to adapt to their culture. Then there's cultural minimization where their culture needs, or my culture needs to supersede your culture. And really where it needs to be is usually culture integration, which is a compromise of which is best. So this is where we can see issues with in-residence and online. If the in-residence is trying to force their culture into the online environment, you're gonna hold it back. But you, you can't just say, well, the online is they're their own thing and they do their own thing. There's gonna be this, you're gonna have your university's logo and your university's name attached to these online programs. So there is, a, you need to want to have a quality program because what they do in that online program is going to affect you in residence. So there's a lot of back and forth with this culture and, and it's not an easy answer. Um, but we, we talked about all these different types of power and, and the different ways that we can empower our chief online education officer with these. So um, if we have a little bit of time, what I'd love to hear from the group uh, is as you go into the chat room, think about some of these different forms of power and just type in what are some of these forms of power that we could give to our chief online education officers to really make our online programs better. And don't just think, well, we can give them expert power. Be specific. What specifically, what is tangible in the real world that I can give my chief online education officers to make our online education quality pro product more quality and get that to the students and make the students better as a result? Um, real quick, let's talk about power distance, okay? So power distance is the degree to which members of a group expect and agree that power should be shared unequally. So how much do people at the bottom accept that people at the top have more power over them? North Korea, huge power distance, okay? So and they give all of the power to their leaders. They're just very subservient. They're very controlled. Whereas here's like, you know, George H.W. Bush, and he's just, he's the top of the country, but he's out running with a whole bunch of other people and everybody's comfortable. Um, the power difference, it, the way I look at this is the perceived difference in power between two individuals. So Power distance would be like the group power difference would be like two individuals. So what does it feel like? So it's it's weird because it's, it's again, something you can actually feel and you've probably felt before. A small power distance is like when you're hanging out with your friends. Everybody's joking. There's probably some curse words flying around, maybe some jokes that are probably not meant for everybody in the world, but it's very comfortable and very open. People are willing to share ideas. Now let's say you're at a formal uh, meeting with your boss. Okay, maybe you feel comfortable sharing your ideas, but it's it's a little more structured. You might be a little more hesitant. You might restrict some of the language that you use. And then there's the pay, big power difference, right? So there's uh, Octavia Spencer. She just met President Obama, and she is just she's just floored. Like it's like she doesn't even know how to speak. Just the power difference there is so big that she can feel it. It's tangible. Now. This is where it's going to get important. What does power distance look like in your organization? So when you empower your chief online education officer and they empower their team and you share that power openly and a lot, you're decreasing the power distance. Lower power distance is going to give you more open uh, communication. It's going to increase innovation and creativity. You're going to see risk taking. You're going to see that flatter organizational structure. This is where we start getting into those innovative online practices where you get virtual reality headsets and training and you've got these Zoom meetings and all these other tools uh, like Yellow Dig. I saw Yellow Dig earlier. Those are the kind of tools that will start popping up when you start empowering your education officers. Higher power distance, you get more structured communication. You're going to get more standardization. There's more risk avoidance. It's taller organizational structure. It's safe, but you're not going to grow and it's going to be pretty boring. So this all goes to say, find what those forms of power are that you can get to your chief online education officer 
and especially that legitimate power like Gio was talking about. Empower them, make sure they're empowering their people, and you'll start to see these benefits of innovation, creativity, risk-taking, communication, and that's what we want. So I think I've used up a lot of my time. So I think now we're at the what can you do to empower your COEO, and I think Gio is taking over from here. Thank you so much. I appreciate you, Travis. And again, let's um, kick this question to our audience. What can you do to empower your COEO? What are some of the challenges that your COEO is experiencing? What are some barriers uh, preventing your COEO from taking measures that would enhance quality of online program administration? Uh, next slide, please. Um, so what I would say briefly, um, if you remember the quality scorecard that I mentioned um, being available and uh, measuring quality in the administration of online programs, the first criterion had to do with institutional support. So the first thing, the best thing we can do to empower our COEOs is um, to uh, make a commitment to um, the strategic importance that online plays at our institution. Once we make that commitment, once online is um, part of our mission, then everything else cascades down. Uh, when it comes to what title we're going to, um, to use for the job of our online person, um, again, the more strategic online is, the higher the title should be on the org chart. Um, there are a few institutions, research shows about 5% of institutions where chief online education officers report directly to the president or chancellor. Uh, but in most cases, the COEO reports to the provost. If nothing else, they need to have access to the provost. So now let's think about their placement on the org chart and upstream and downstream reporting. So uh, looking upstream, the COEO needs to have um, access to the senior most executive officers of the institution. As I mentioned, provost, president, chancellor, uh, they need to be a peer to C-suite members. And um, if you'd like to learn more, please join us tomorrow when Dr. Melanie Shaw is going to um, revisit the study that she and her team did uh, to paint a picture of um, the chief online education officer role and particularly how they can uh, progress. Um, that will be a, a lovely presentation. I warmly recommend it to everyone. Looking at uh, downstream reporting, um, who all reports to the COEO? Well, again, the more strategic online is to the institution, uh, the broader the portfolio of the COEO and the broader um, or the larger the number of units reporting to the COEO. So um, in most institutions, you will see, <clears throat> excuse me, some level of educational technology uh, falling under the COEO. Um, this is typically uh, the, the most um, basic uh, function that institutions that are just beginning to uh, dabble in online um, ascribe to their COEO. So some kind of responsibility over edtech. Um, but then um, we're going to see instructional design, um, curriculum development. Uh, we're going to see faculty development and um, many other uh, teams. So um, according to um, uh, research, the more strategic the importance of online, the higher the number of reporting units um, that um, go to the COEO. Again, I mentioned the portfolio. If you look over to the right, um, the portfolio um, can include everything from um, strategic pieces such as uh, mission and accreditation, and then operational pieces, scheduling, quality assurance, curriculum, tech, um, all sorts of um, faculty development and supports and um, student support. The larger the portfolio, uh, the larger the budget ought to be. So the best way to empower COEOs is to give them the budget, which allows them to operationalize this um, 
mission, um, this strategy um, um, when it comes to online. And then, of course, the CEO can be empowered by giving them influence in all aspects of online strategy and operations. Um, they need to be able to pass um, policies specific to online, so they need to have access to faculty senate. They need to have a voice in the faculty senate. Um, they need to be able to implement the process for online course design, so they need to have a voice on um, institutional curriculum committees, so on and so forth. So um, on chat, I see that Glenn recommends communicating often. That's a great way to empower the COEO, absolutely. Um, let's go to the next slide. So this is, um, uh, we're at the five minute mark, so maybe we could um, land here and invite any questions. Um, if there are no questions, we could go into a little bit more details with the uh, tool that Travis developed to measure power. And um, Travis, could I maybe ask you to show us a little bit about your tool and to explain um, how that tool should be used or should not be used? Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. So I've got a couple extra slides here. I'll go through them real quick, then I'll pull up the tool. but. Uh, the idea here uh, behind this tool is to measure that power difference between individuals and then understand how the leader's perspective on what the power distance is and what the follower's perspective is, making sure that those match and then looking out for behaviors that show you that that power distance is mismatched to where it needs to be. So you can shift the, the where your power distance is in your organization um, by doing specific things. So to decrease the power distance, you basically, uh, in, so you're, you're basically, you have all this power, they don't have any, you empower them by giving them power. So that's going to get that power distance lower. Sometimes you have power that you can't empower them with. So you find ways to mitigate the power that you have. So in residence programs, a lot of time it's, it's weird to not be called Dr. Laws or Dr. Neil, but in an online format, it's actually pretty common to have instructors using their first name because the, the audience, the target audience is usually a lot more educated, a little older, and you, you want them to be more comfortable with that open communication. So that's one example of mitigating your power. If you want to increase that power distance, you're just going to use your power or retain the power that you have. And then based on the power distance, you'll see a power gap or power difference that's set too high People will be frustrated, trapped, micromanaged. They'll give up. Uh, if you set the power gap too low, the power difference too low, you'll start seeing a, a lack of direction, anxiety, avoidance, and confusion. Uh, and you have to watch out for subordinates that are personalized power oriented as well. Um, so basically, how do you apply this? You try to figure out where the organizational power distance is. Understand that there's a little bit of wiggle room either way to shift that power distance. But if you try to shift it too much, you'll see these behaviors or those behaviors. And we can get into more detail. If this is something you guys are interested in, please reach out to me, shoot me an email. I'd be happy to share with you what I have. Um, let me pull up uh, the actual tool for you. So right now it's just an Excel format. So what we do is you're going to give one to your subordinates. You're going to give one to the leader or the chief online education officer or whoever it is of the organization. You've got this little questionnaire that's going to try to de determine where the uh, organizational power distance is. Uh, you're going to measure the cultural variables. You've got questions, 50 questions associated with those 10 different forms of power we talked about. The subordinate gets questions. Uh, then the superior gets asked the exact same questions. And then at the end, you get this score sheet where you get the answers side by side. And by getting these answers side by side, you start to figure out where maybe those mismatches are. So maybe you think that um, an ability or uh, an individual's access to information is the most important thing, but your subordinates think that uh, how much people admire or look up to in a person is more important. So you kind of start to give the leader a little more insight into what their subordinates think is important with regards to power. Then you go through and you compare each individual question. And based on that, you can figure out which forms of power specifically 
are mismatched. So maybe you're using too much coercive power or you're not giving them enough referent power. And that's where you start to see those mismatches. And then by the end, you, you get this, this, this layout uh, that gives you all the answers. But the idea here is you have a third party that, that runs this, this tool for you. So you have the leader who's going to answer their questions, the subordinate answers their questions, but because there's a third party, the subordinates should feel comfortable knowing that their answers are going to be anonymous and that they can answer honestly. Based on the information, the leadership coach or the consultant looks at the information, puts it in a format to the leader to say, here's what we found out. These are the, where, these are the areas that you could improve your behaviors to better match what your subordinates expect. Or these are ways that you could improve the balance with what you're what you're expecting from your subordinates. So that's just a quick overview of what we're expecting with the, the tool. But again, if this is something you're interested in, please reach out to me. I'd be happy to share what I have. It's still in its infancy. So there, there's still some bugs to work out, but it's 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 I think gonna be pretty good. Let me put our information back up one more time. All Thank right. you so much, Travis. Right. Thank you. I appreciate you. Many thanks to our audience for uh, for your participation. James, thank you so much for moderating for us. It was an honor to work with you once again.